Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Jesko again from AcousticsInsider.com, and I'm joined once again by Graham from Music City Acoustics. Hey, Graham. Hey, how's it going? I'm good. I'm good. Well, to be honest, if anything, I'm joining you because we're obviously on your channel today yeah. for part two in our video series of uh, on treating your demo room. And uh, guys, if you haven't seen this yet, uh, we, we did a part one, which is hosted on my channel. The link is going to be in the description and we're going to link it up here as well. You want to check that out before you dive into this video. But uh, what we're gonna basically going to do in this video is we're going to walk you through the planning of the treatment and the installation of all the treatment that you can see in this feed, obviously behind Graham and um, Real quick, before we get to that, uh, I want to uh, make you aware of Graham's install guide for his panels, which you can get at the link in the description. So this is basically a panel install guide for wall panels, for ceiling panels, uh, for corner panels, right, Graham? These include all the tools, yeah. all the hardware, everything you basically need uh, to install your panels, but any type of acoustic panels, really. Um, yeah, exactly. They're all step-by-step -step guides you know starting from the required tools to the hardware to actually figure out how to figure out where those panels are going to go in your room and how to install them excellent yeah so again if you want uh, to uh, get access to those check the link in the description and uh, with that let's jump right into talking about the planning of this room and i guess the first question is we left off obviously with the empty room in the last video and you then went through the process of planning all of this. Where did you even start? What, what was kind of the first step getting into the planning of the treatment of this room? Yeah, so step one with this room and pretty much any room that uh, we work on is just measuring out the room. So learning what it is that we're working with. Um, first and foremost, what are the dimensions of the space? Where are the windows? Where are the doors? Uh, you know, so we can start to see if those are gonna be problems. Then looking a little bit more potentially towards like the materials that are in the room, which we touched on in the last video. Um, you know, what's the floor? Is it on a slab? Is it on a open crawl space type um, structure or second story of a building, whatever it may be. And then like, what are the walls made out of? But first and foremost is really just the dimensions. Um, and then from there, taking that and starting to plan out the treatment and looking at how are we going to use the space? What are our goals? Um, if we were working with somebody else, it'd be, you know, much more so like, what are their goals? What do they want the room to look and feel like just as much as what do we want the room to sound like? Um, and for what, our, what was the, what was the goal for this room? Talking about goals, obviously you're your own client in a way. Yeah. So kind so of what, for, what goals did you have for this room? For our purposes, we want to make one, I mean, I want this room to feel great. I'll probably spend most of my days in here actually working, but, um, but mostly we wanted to be able to kind of take this space and show what could be done, you know, what the potential is for a room, a relatively like standard home size studio space, and how far can you take that with your pretty standard acoustic panel base trap type product. Um, so there weren't really any limitations in terms of like where we could put things outside of where the doors are, which is why we've got like freestanding panels on the back wall. Um, otherwise, it's pretty much as big and deep of, of panels as we could put in here with air gaps and in most places and really kind of crammed it all in. Fortunately, it was a good sized room, so it wasn't too small. And so our first and main goal was really to create a space that sounds great and shows off, you know, what you can do with a room. If you're trying to create the ultimate mix room or production room, um, sure. how far can you really take that? And so in this particular case, obviously you were using all of your own products. And I think these are all standard products, as you mentioned before. Um, yeah. As in people can buy them as we as we see them in your room right now. Um, but can yeah. you maybe walk me through the process of deciding what to use and why? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, like I said, we basically figure out how what we want to use the space for, what are the dimensions, and then we really start to figure out where things can go. So knowing that we wanted to make this as good as possible, um, we used base trap panels everywhere in this room. Um, so opting for like the thickest panel or the thickest standard panel that we make so it's six and a half inches deep, um, and we use that on the for the clouds in here, uh, which we've got lights in, because um, we covered up all the ce the whole ceiling's covered in clouds. So we've got lights in those, uh, soffit corner traps 
pretty much everywhere around the room that we could fit them, as well as corner traps in the front corners. And then all of our sidewall panels, we went with base trap panels as well. And so main kind of overall theory or principle there in terms of like why base trap panels is the thicker the panel, the lower in frequency it's going to work. And we want to as evenly as possible absorb across the frequency spectrum and to create a really balanced listening environment in here. Um, and so there was nowhere in this room that was going to be better served or suited with a four inch deep panel or a two inch deep panel because they're not going to be nearly as effective at lower frequencies. So we really opted for thicker panels. All of the sidewall panels are mounted six inches off of the wall to get that air gap that will extend that low frequency performance. The front corner panels, which are actually eight foot by four foot base trap panels. So they're pretty, they're pretty big and hefty. Um, and those are straddling the corner at 30 degrees. So pretty close to the, the angle that we actually have the monitors at. Um, and that allows us to have like a two, two and a half foot air gap behind them in the middle of that panel. So a lot of air really pushes them out into the room where we have a lot more uh, air particle movement, which allows them to be much more effective. Uh, and then the other main thing was the back wall. I kind of mentioned this, but there's doors on both the left and the right side, one to a closet and then one to the, uh, the rest of the office space. And so to kind of deal with those, we ended up putting gobos, so like freestanding panels that are on wheels um, to treat the back of the back wall as opposed to a wall mounted panel where we wouldn't have been able to get as much of an air gap because um, it would have impeded the doors. Now, if the doors are an issue, we can just move the gobos out of the way. So we kind of get the optimum uh, acoustic performance, but also the flexibility to make sure we can get in and out of the room and into that closet. Yeah, totally. And I mean, the gobo is really the, the, the main difference to a standard wall mounted panel is literally, literally just that you can move them, right? In terms of performance, yeah, there's, there's no difference. Acoustically, there's very little difference. The, our gobos, um, our standard gobos have one side that actually has pegboard on them and one side that's fabric faced. Okay. So there's a, they are a little different from like our regular panels. That's mostly for a tracking scenario. You know, if somebody wants sure. either a more reflective diffuse side versus a more absorptive side. Uh, so not a whole lot of, um, it's not a whole, they don't have a big impact in this case so much. Uh, one thing that will probably change is that we'll add slats to those diffusers. Mm -hmm. or, sorry, we'll add slats to those gobos. Um, so kind of like our scatter faces to add a little bit more reflections into this room. Um, just kind of based off of hearing it and in, in what it's at, what it sounds like at this stage. Um, so that was, I guess, the long answer to our over, overall arching approach or overall approach to uh, treating the space was really to use as big of panels as possible in, in terms of depth uh, and to really cover as much as possible because we don't want a bunch of reflective surfaces. Uh, it's not to say that you necessarily have to treat every wall or the entirety of your ceiling in a home studio, but if you want to make it as good as possible and try and get it to, you know, the point of purpose-built studios that are going to cost a million dollars plus, then taking a similar approach to really treating everywhere that we can is going to get us there uh, or get us as close to that as possible. Um, totally. And so this kind of covers everything from, you know, early reflections on the side walls to early reflections off of the ceiling um, and then also dealing with you know, uh, low frequency concern. So how do we get as many of those corners covered up to get the most balanced low frequency decay time that we can? Because that's where we're going to make the biggest impact on that front. Um, corners are super helpful for that in terms of like the axial modes. So both floor to ceiling, left to right, and front to back. That really needs to be addressed primarily with panels or base traps on those surfaces. Um, so on that back wall, we've got the gobos. On the side walls, we obviously have the base trap panels that I mentioned. And then on the ceiling, we have three seven foot by four foot base trap panels. Um, so those are doing a lot for our high and mid frequencies, you know, dealing with reflections right off of the actual ceiling, but also then a ton for the low frequency response of the room. Yeah. In terms of really controlling that floor to ceiling mode, making sure that, um, and in this case, it's about 130 hertz, but making sure there's not a huge peak there. In most home studios with eight foot ceilings, it's 140 hertz, and it's just this huge booming resonance, you know, right in like the low range of an acoustic guitar or a vocal, um, and it can just kind of wreck havoc on rooms. Um, and yeah, so that's that's kind of the basic gist, you know, bass trap yeah. panels everywhere we could everywhere <laughs> we could fit them and, and try to make it in look one, good. In one sentence, yeah. 
Um, you obviously mentioned your Scatterface uh, talking about diffusion. When we're thinking about the planning of the treatment, how do we think about absorption versus diffusion? How do you think about absorption versus diffusion when you're approaching the planning of the treatment? Yeah. Um, so to begin with, I primarily think about absorption. Mm -hmm. Diffusion is great and it's definitely necessary because we don't want to spend all day in an overly treated room. It's what will make it feel very unbalanced. It'll give us you know, a headache. It'll be very fatiguing. You can't work in there for a long time. However, diffusion from a practical standpoint doesn't allow us to address the whole frequency response or the whole frequency spectrum. Um, so when we're looking at trying to treat you know, as close to possible to, uh, to 20 hertz and then all the way up to 20,000 hertz, there's no way I could fit a diffuser in here that could get anywhere close to 20 hertz in terms of being capable of actually diffusing low frequencies. Um, the diffuser itself wouldn't fit in this room, nor would it have enough room to diffuse that that frequency. So uh, to start with, it's you know our approach is almost always broadband absorption. How do we get uh, absorption across the frequency spectrum to really hone things in as much as possible um, while trying to address everything? And then from there, once we've treated or once we've really kind of absorbed most of the things that we're looking to to solve and created a, a pretty well balanced frequency response, then we'll start to add in diffusion or scattering on top of that so that they can work in conjunction with one another. Um, if we were to only put diffusers in here, you would end up with a room that, you know, from a thousand hertz and up might sound great. It'd be pretty lively. It'd be a very hard space to mix in. Uh, might be a pretty good listening room. But from a thousand hertz and below, you would have no idea what's going on. It would be boomy. It would be muddy. Um, you wouldn't have any clarity or punch and tightness to your low end. Um, and so if we're looking for definition and focus in that low end, it's all absorption. And then for our high and mid frequencies, on top of the base trap panels, we can use scatter faces or we can start to put in different types of diffusers uh, depending on the space. Right, right, right. And I mean, and that is very, very much a uh, an approach or a, uh, a goal, in some way also an issue with particular to small rooms, right? Right. Like as, as the room gets larger, and maybe the purpose also changes. Obviously, this is now a a, 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 a solidly a mixing production kind of set, set up or room that you you're, you intend to work with work on with your speakers. But if this was a combined mixing room and recording room, for example, or if this was a slightly bigger room, how would that change your approach? Yeah. So if this was like a primarily music production, vocal recording, acoustic guitar recording space I probably wouldn't change anything other than mm -hmm. like do we have this much room to work with we may not have the air gap on the side walls um, you know certain things like that but in terms of like this would be an incredible room to record a vocal in mm -hmm. um, if we're recording drums and you want a more lively space if you're recording a string quartet or a solo instrumentalist um, then we may want some more life to the space so then either I would still treat a lot of those areas because if we're starting with a rectangle, there's not a whole lot um, that that room untreated is necessarily going to have to offer unless we can get a lot of absorption and diffusion in there. Uh, and then it's kind of a balancing act of those two. And it will very much so depend on how much is mixing or monitoring a priority if it's one room or do we have two rooms? Because if it's a tracking room, I'm much less concerned about how much low frequency absorption do we have. Um, you know, it's, it's important to have that so you have an overall well-balanced space. But unlike a mix room, you can move your instruments around. You can move your microphones around. So the overall impact that the room is going to have on those sources can be controlled and vary a lot. Um, and here, we've got speakers, we've got a listening position. Those things are pretty fixed, and the room will do all sorts of things to that. So if it's purely a tracking room, um, we can lean a lot more on diffusion and maintaining some of that life, whether it's space coupling diffusers, scatter faces on top of panels, or QRD diffusers um, to really break up some of those reflections through parallel surface uh, on par occurring between parallel surfaces um, and improve things that way. So it's very sort of um, goal oriented in terms of, you know, what's the space being used for and then really determining how to best treat that space based off of what's going to be done in there. Um, right. It's it's like it's like deciding which tool is the right tool to get to your goal, right? Yeah, exactly. 
And if it's always kind of one of those things, at least normally if we're working on it, it's like if mixing and monitoring is occurring in that space, that tends to kind of dominate how it would be treated because the needs of that are quite high. If it's primarily a recording space, then we're going to you know, lean way back on potentially the bass traps and focus more so on retaining some life to that space so it's got a sound, but also trying to balance it out as much as possible. Nice, yeah. Um, you brought a model along with us as well, uh, with you for us as well. Maybe we can have a look at that and dive into some some of the specifics you did on each of the surfaces, because I think that yeah. would be really interesting for everybody to see. Uh, do you maybe just want to open that up and maybe we'll start with the front wall uh, just to see what you've actually done there. Can you just walk me through that and why why did you do what you did on the front wall? Um, yeah, so the front wall is mostly uh, made up of these two eight by four foot base trap panels that if I go to our top down view, we can see kind of how they're straddling the corners here. So we've mm -hmm. got a lot of air behind them. Um, and that was the area in the room where we could get, you know, hopefully the most low frequency absorption. Um, getting those base trap panels as far away from those corners so that they're out in, out within the room um, where we have a lot of air particle movement. So the highest velocity point, or at least the, the highest area of velocity where we can put a panel in this space. Mm -hmm. um, and letting those do a lot of the work to control the decay time of the room and really start to balance things out in that regard. And then also helping with some reflections off that front wall. Um, potential downsides to this, and we'll see how things start to sound as we as start listening here and taking measurements. Um, our reflections off that front wall, SBIR issues can be a, a concern, and this does push the panels off the wall quite a bit, but also keeps them in the same position that we found um, doing our listening test from that first video. And so speakers are exactly where you know the the most ideal placement was for that. Um, so yeah, just really big corner bass traps, you know, nothing too crazy. It's, um, as I think, similarly to what you found, most of my design and experience in acoustics come from trying things out in my studio. And so before I was doing, you know, acoustic design and, and building panels and products, um, I tried just about everything you could think of in my home studio and read everything that was available online, and most of it didn't work. And so ultimately kind of this room's the culmination of figuring out you know what works what doesn't work what really makes an impact um and so utilizing the corners for low frequency decay times is super helpful making sure that we're treating the side walls and the front walls with base trap panels and panels that are capable of really controlling those axial modes is also hugely important because the corners aren't going to take care of those on their own um, and the same thing applies to the ceiling so that's kind of the starting point here corners are hugely helpful but certainly don't do everything on their own so from there we kind of you know if we show the back wall then um mm -hmm. let me let me just jump in real quick just to mention obviously oh yeah we're gonna we're gonna look at the individual sides of the room now uh but it, it, the, all of this works together right it's right it's, it's one big system of absorption of of treatment that controls the acoustics in the space and although there are certain aspects that are particular to certain uh, surfaces. It's all together that makes the whole thing work, right? So although we're looking at this kind of separately right now, uh, you, you do have to think of the acoustic response in terms of the entirety of the room, right? And so when we're talking about axial modes, uh, controlling modes, this doesn't just happen in the front. This doesn't just happen in the back. This doesn't just happen in the ceiling corners on the ceiling. It potentially happens everywhere. And although uh, we're looking at individual parts of this. Uh, each of these sides contribute to controlling one or more aspects of the entire room response, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and that's why, so like if we look, you know, just real quick, when we're looking at, um, if we're working on somebody's room and we have like a free room advice form on our website and we get, we get a lot of submissions. And, and so the way that we approach those, it's like, what is your use for this space? What is the budget? And then how do we take everything that we're really showing here? Because this is kind of the complete picture of what can be done, but pick and choose the right parts of that that are going to make the biggest impact um, for a room. Because it is entirely a system. It's not one thing is going to fix your room or one, one wall being treated or just the corners is going to give you a great room response. 
it really takes addressing the room as a whole, and that can be done in stages, um, and certain things are going to have a bigger impact than others. But And we'll talk about need... that in a second. Um, yeah. But I'll ask you, let, let's jump back uh, to this and then kind of uh, to do the detour yeah. and talk about that in a second. But let, yeah, let's talk about the back wall. For sure. So a uh, little bit different from our front wall here because, you, as you can see, we've got doors in both of these corners. So we couldn't really treat the corner spaces themselves and get into the room or access this closet here. And so, like I said earlier, we went with these gobos. Um, let me hide this front wall, get a little better view. So we went with the front wall um, so that we could access the doors and then also uh, treated the back uh, wall ceiling corners as well. Um, so fortunately, ceiling height in this room allowed us to get those up there without impeding the doors at all. And uh, just another area where we can start to treat the corners, get base trap panels that are really going to work low into the frequency um, spectrum and get more control over that area below 100 hertz, which is typically pretty hard and challenging to control because it takes a lot of space. Um, so that's the main goal with the back wall. And then obviously dealing with, you know, in addition to low frequency concerns, just dealing with reflections off of this wall. It's right behind those speakers. And so making sure that from a stereo imaging and depth of field standpoint, we don't have a ton of high frequency and mid frequencies coming off that wall back at us. Okay. And I, um, I mentioned this. I, 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 I was just wondering, can you explain to us what the difference is between treating low or doing low end control on the actual surface in comparison to the corner panels? What's, what's the difference in terms of low frequency control when we're talking about corner panels versus kind of flat on the surface panels, if you will. Yeah, so if they're flat on a boundary, you know, mounted flush to that boundary or the wall or the ceiling, um, the biggest difference between that and the corner, you know, I can show you here is, so the gobos have an air gap, but if they were mounted flush to that wall like this and there's no air behind it, um, from a physics standpoint, air particles are going to move a lot more around this area of the room. Yeah. And it, <laughs> low, you know, low frequency and as air we particles. Get, yeah. Yes. And yeah. if we get to the boundary, they don't move because all the pressure builds up. So it's just like driving a car into a wall or running straight into a wall. You have a lot of speed and moment. You have a lot of speed and momentum until you hit that wall and then it folds. So instead of like moving like this, as soon as you get to the boundary, it just crumbles on top of itself. And so and all that, you, you know, you could be a lot of pressure there, but no movement. Exactly. Yeah. And so you could be driving, you know, 60 miles an hour, 100 miles an hour. And as soon as you hit that wall, you come to a complete stop. Well, porous absorbers, so any insulation type acoustic panel works off of that particle movement. So we need the air to actually be moving in order for these to be effective. The further away from the walls we get, the more particle movement and the more speed or velocity we have. So they're more effective. Um, in the corners, we have a full foot um, air gap from that middle of the panel. And, you know, depending on the directionality of those sound waves, things are going to travel through this panel quite a bit before they're actually hitting a boundary, which makes it uh, a much better low frequency absorber just because it's in a better part of the room to effectively absorb low frequencies. Uh, if we were to mount that right up on the wall, we don't have it in the most optimum place, the most optimal place for it to really perform as well as it can. And so we just don't get the same performance out of it. Um, nothing's changing about the panel or the product. It's just where it is in the room and how it is uh, going to be able to affect the, the acoustic energy that we're trying to control. Can you, can you say roughly what frequency range is affected by a corner panel versus a panel that is placed like this in front of a wall? Yeah, so if you take a, um, you know, I'd say if you take like a six inch panel or so and you mount that flush to the wall, it will work pretty well down to 125 hertz or so. Um, it will work lower than that, but like its effective range kind of starts to roll off there. The If you put a panel in the corner, it's going to depend a little, you know, it there's not like super great hard science on this, but Typically, something like this will give you a lot more control all the way down to 40 hertz or so. Mm -hmm. um, depending on the air gap, you know, those front corners can can go down even lower than that. 
Um, so it really is just dependent on the depth of the air gap that we have and then also the depth of the panel, obviously. Yeah, yeah. But okay. it is a, yeah. mm -hmm. a, a big jump. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thanks, yeah. So um, does that cover what, oh yeah, fi final thing I wanted to uh, ask you about the back wall gobos, you've left some gaps in between them. There are some gaps yeah. in between your corner panels as well. What's what's the deal with those? Does does that impact the sound in any negative way? How do you think about that? Um, well, so let me start with these corner traps here. This is primarily just from an installation standpoint. You have to be able to get your hand in between them to connect the hardware. <laughs> um, and so if you don't leave those, it's also oh, sorry. It's also the reason that even on the sides of these, there's a tiny gap there. Mm -hmm. uh, so not much, but just this is purely there. So there's like just enough room to get your hand in it and connect the hardware for them. Um, the bat on these gobos, it more so is just kind of the size of the gobos and the space that's there. From a low frequency standpoint, it has very little to no impact on their performance. Um, you know, the room at low frequencies is acting much more like a system. Low frequencies are going to travel in more of like a wave-like pattern so much more broadly as opposed to high frequencies where it's more kind of ray, you know, like a laser. So it's like wherever that speaker's point is where those high frequencies are going, your low frequencies are just kind of moving across the room. Um, so yeah, some high frequencies may get through here uh, and come back, but the chance that they're going to make their way through here and then also perfectly reflect back out is pretty unlikely. Um, when you start to look at reflections and ray tracing, you get into, which is just kind of figuring out where the waveforms are actually moving, uh, the angle of incidence going to equal the angle of reflection. And so uh, for the most part, nothing's actually going to get through here and come straight back out. And it just doesn't really result in It's just in highly problems. unlikely, isn't it? Like, yes, yeah. it's possible, but it's so unlikely that you can basically neglect it. Exactly. Uh, and particularly because okay. at higher frequencies, if we do end up putting those scatter faces um and wood slats on those gobos and they're going to start to diffuse and reflect some of that stuff and it, it's just like it it's not a real problem that occurs yeah. within a actual space yeah 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 good excellent um should we move on to the sidewalls then have a look at what you did there yeah absolutely sidewalls on each side of the room are the same um and which is definitely something i would recommend doing you know we want things to be as symmetrical as possible um whether it's treatment furniture if you're building the room from the ground up where the doors the windows are all that stuff the more symmetrical the spaces the more um accurate your left and right monitoring is going to be you know we want the exact same performance out of the left and right speakers and if we can put those in spaces that are perfectly symmetrical we're setting ourselves up for success in, in that regard so treatment on both sides of the room is identical and then we've got uh, our base trap panels here up in that wall ceiling corner again so same kind of thing you know wherever we can put that um, wherever or wherever we can put a panel with you know base trap panel and get that air gap we're going to do it and uh, it does make a big difference when we start looking at measurements and each time you put one of those in just the overall smoothness of the low frequency response and then also the decay time getting shorter and shorter and more balanced because when we start putting panels in here, all the high frequency energy and all that mid frequency energy very quickly gets sucked up. And if we don't address the low frequencies, we're going to end up with a room that is very imbalanced, particularly in the decay time. And that's what makes the low end feel soft and tubby and doesn't really hit you in the chest and have the tightness and definition that's needed to make accurate mixed decisions, you know, in regards to how do the bass and kick drum sit together or how does this synth that you're, you know, and how does all that kind of mix together? So anywhere we can squeeze it in there, uh, we're going to do so. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we've got base trap panels on the side wall as well. Um, and you'll see here, if I kind of scroll around to the side, these are mounted off the wall six inches just to get as much air as possible behind them without making the room start to feel like it's closing in on you. Mm -hmm. And so this is a little bit room dependent. You know, the room's got to be wide enough for this to be a suitable option. Um, and here, the room's a little over, what is it? A little over 11 feet wide, 11 foot five. Um, 
it's not the widest room, but you know, for what we're using it for, the acoustics um, was kind of the main priority. And we're not going to have eight people in here for a recording session. Uh, it is, you know, very much so will be used as a office and a demo room to have people come and listen and hear what, you know, what a room can sound like. And so uh, spacing the panels off the wall was definitely something that we wanted to do. And in any mixed room is something that I strongly re recommend uh, anybody do in their space. And then we've got a couple scatter faces on their show now. And this is something that again may change as we um, start to listen a little bit more. These panels just got put in here last night. It got the, the gobos built and, and everything up. So uh, once we have some time to actually sit in here and listen, we may add more scatter faces in just depending on how the overall balance is feeling. If it's a little bit too dry in here, we can add a couple more in here um, on each side and kind of take it from there. But nothing too crazy you know it's basically mm -hmm. if i add in the the front wall treatment if i can find it you'll see there's there's really no part of this area uh that isn't covered mm -hmm. and so as i mentioned earlier just kind of overall approach is treat as much as we can eliminate the room as much as possible because we want to hear our speakers and now the room's imparting on it so uh, I was just thinking about the this whole debate um, around uh, absorption versus diffusion slash reflection from the side walls. So, yeah. how do you think about lateral reflections coming from the sides? Is that can you can you just like talk about that a bit? How you think about that? Yeah. So it depends. I would say a little bit on the application in the setting. In a mix room, I don't really want them. Mm -hmm. uh, there are, I think, you know, from a listening room standpoint, they can be beneficial, not in terms of creating the most accurate environment, but creating a more pleasing, fun mm -hmm. space to listen to music in. Um, and so that's, again, where kind of the purpose and the goals of the space are going to come into play. Now, what you actually want in, within those reflections can change because you probably don't want low frequency, low mid frequency low mid reflections coming back and really um, imparting that signature on your speaker's frequency response. What you may want is the high and mid frequency reflections. Um, and so then a combination of, you know, diffuser and bass traps on the sidewalls would be more suitable. Most listening rooms aren't really built out to that extent. Um, scatter faces are an option, but aren't like a true QRD diffuser in the sense of how they work. So they don't impart nearly as much uh, of their kind of sound or signature on what you're hearing. Um, so in like this setting, I wouldn't put a QRD diffuser probably anywhere near the left or the right sidewalls at early reflection stages. I don't want that, you know, the diffusion as a whole is going to impart more of a coloration to what your speakers are doing than absorption. Absorption's mm -hmm. main goal is to kind of just get rid of that boundary or that wall or surface, whereas diffusion is reflecting it typically in a more even way but it's still retaining a lot of energy and redistributing it back into the room. So from a mix room, a production room standpoint, you know, directly to the left and the right of the speakers and around the listening position, I'd primarily go with absorption. Um, outside of that, you can get a little bit more creative if you have the room to do it and you have the low frequency absorption that's really needed. But otherwise, I wouldn't go too heavy on, too heavy on diffusion around there unless it's like purely a listening room. Uh, and at the end, the low frequency concerns are really addressed or just aren't the main goal of that project. Yeah, yeah. And so if if you kind of add in these these scatter uh, scatter faces, diffuser fronts, as I call them, whatever you want to call them, really uh, slats on top of absorbers, um, the the main goal is to just change the perception of the room, not in, not how energy actually reflects back that is emanated from the speakers, right? This is about this is about yeah. a, a feel, just the feel of the room as you're in it. Uh, and that's that's what it's about, really, when we're working with these type of kind of high mid, uh, high frequency diffusers. Yeah, exactly. With, you know, if you look at like measurements of a room with or without them, you don't see the decay time at like high and mid frequencies really go up. And that's true even with diffusion for the most part, yeah. because you have a reduction in energy as you break it up. Um, but particularly with these, this is in large part more of like a, a 
playing off of a psychoacoustic need on our end. It's like our brains are constantly trying to understand what space are we in. And if we put absorbers everywhere, our brain doesn't hear reflections, and then it doesn't understand what room or what environment we're in, and that's what makes it really fatiguing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what makes it hard to work in for you know more than an hour or so at a time. And so it's uh, really just sort of identifying the need that we have to understand the space that we're in and to not over-treat those mid and high frequencies in a way that makes the room hard to be in. Yeah, totally, yeah. Um, should we move on to the ceiling, maybe? Yeah, definitely. Do you want to show me what you've done there, please? Yeah, so the ceiling is um, just three uh, base trap panels again, but they are a little unique in this case in that they have these lights that are shown here. So we obviously covered up the entire ceiling, and... Uh, in a lot of studios, best case scenario, or a lot of mix rooms, we would approach it similarly to this. Um, and so putting lights directly in the panels is something we've started to do because we're often covering up the lights. And so nothing too crazy other than, you know, again, base trap panels so that we can get both the high and mid frequency control that we need for reflections off the ceiling and also really addressing some of the low frequency concerns in the room. And, uh, the only unique thing probably about these, at least for us, was if I go to the top down view and bring back in all of our treatment, you'll see there's some overlap with the corner panels that we had here and, and just in terms of figuring out how we could possibly get as much control in this space as possible. Uh, Space-wise, that had a few implications. One, these panels are actually seven feet wide as opposed to like the corner shelves, which is eight feet tall or eight feet wide. Um, that's a much more like standard dimension for us, but we can you know, we can really make panels in any size. So these middle base traps were also a little unique in order to fit them in here. Um, and so slightly odd size, but nothing too crazy. And then it did affect the height that they had to be hung at because we couldn't bring them up any higher uh, than these front and back wall base traps would allow. And so a little bit of... Uh, trickiness there on the install just from the standpoint that we had to install things in the right order or we wouldn't be able to get other things up um, and it all kind of worked together in that regard but otherwise yeah just pretty standard base trap panels uh, that's what I do in probably 90% of the rooms that we work on because it's the most effective thing uh, that it's, we can throw the, in there it's one of the main big surfaces that is out of the way and treatable Yeah, and uh, one of the reasons why when people talk about treating office spaces, for example, uh, the the one and often only place where they put treatment is under the seating, yeah, because yeah. it's kind of the 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 most no brainer place to uh, put a lot of treatment. And then with right. that uh, with that air gap, you can get some some pretty decent base absorption as well. And uh, with that amount of surface area, that actually has a, a significant impact. Exactly. Yeah, and it's often you know, overlooked a lot. People always think about like treating the walls. You got to treat your left and your right early reflections and your back wall, but it's uh, the ceiling both from a low frequency response and it's oftentimes the surface that's closest to people. So if you're mm -hmm. thinking about like, if you're really trying to like dig into where your early reflections are occurring, in a lot of rooms, it's the ceiling that has the first reflection that's coming back to you. Well, I mean, that's a, that's a, I think a, a great uh, segue talking about priorities Obviously, this is now a, a full treatment plan and a full treatment of this room. For many people, that won't be an option or maybe they just don't want to go that far right from the start. So yeah. when we're thinking about starting with the treatment, where would you start? With which positions would you start in this room and why? Um, yeah, okay. So it depends as everything does, it depends on how basically like the biggest determining factor would be is budget in that case, budget and space. You know, it's kind of like our, you know, everything sort of starts with those two things because space will inform where they can go, uh, how big they can be, how they can be installed. And then the budget's going to start to determine just how many panels I can use to work with. Um, you know, let's say if it's only, if we're starting with four broadband or bass trap panels i would in most cases probably start with the front like a, a panel or two panels on the front wall and a one panel on the left and the right 
sides of the room. You could, depending on the room, change that to the ceiling. At that stage, you're really just starting to treat things and make an improvement. So placement's a little bit less important in the sense that anywhere you start to treat is going to make a pretty significant improvement, but is also going to leave a lot of things that still need to be developed and treated and, um, you know, really kind of controlled. So with that, it's not like one's going to make or break your room at that stage. It's all incrementally going to make it better. Um, if we could start to put 10 panels in that room, then really start to split it up between probably the front corners, uh, definitely panels on the ceiling like we've done here. So at least two panels. Ideally, that ceiling treatment's going to cover both the speaker and the listening position. Um, that's really important from the low end performance that we're going to get out of it. Purely from a reflection standpoint, I care more so about the space in between the speakers and the, and the listening position. Um, and then the back wall. The back wall has a like everything has a ton of implications and, and a thing and a lot of things that it impacts and affects. Um, but from everything, you know, reflections off of that to low frequency performance of your of your speakers, that's going to be an area. So it, it, it's always kind of a combination of those things. It's just balancing out how much of it can we focus on treating reflections off of the boundaries in close proximity to you. And then how much of that can we balance out in regards to corner placement and treating low frequencies and then also another consideration that comes into play very quickly is like are you recording in that space because if it's a dual purpose space and you're recording in it i'm going to focus more of that treatment on the walls than i would in the corners um forego a little bit of the low end absorption and our a capability to absorb some of that low frequency information right off the bat and hopefully address that in a second or third stage of treatment, but start to create a space that will work really well to record vocals or to record acoustic guitars in that space. And the main goal there is is reflection control, right? So exactly. as you said, we're foregoing bass control in an effort to improve reflection control because when we're coding, that's gonna be a higher up the priority kind of food chain. Yes, so it, yeah, and it's, um, uh, I've we've got an article on our website about it, but basically like the four, uh, four like core principles of home studio design, and 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 then uh, there's like four questions and four principles. So it's always like space, as I mentioned, kind of space, budget, goals. Apparently, I shouldn't write articles because I don't remember what's in them. <laughs> there's a fourth one. That's fine. We'll put. I don't we'll know what it link. is. We'll put a link to that as well. In yeah, the description but it's always out, kind yeah. of the you know it's it's always those things. So it's like you know in a room where you're both mixing and recording a lot of vocals, reflection control might take a priority um, over having the best low frequency response, you know, at that stage, because that's what the room is mostly going to be used for. And that's the most important thing. It's always about making it work for whatever the intended purpose or use is of that space. Totally. Yeah. Um, I'm very curious at this point to know in terms of installing all of this, like what like what effort goes into installing uh, installing all these panels it looks like a lot of work do you have any advice for people to make this if they do this on their own to make this as easy and as seamless as possible yeah um so i'm pretty fortunate in that we have a model of this room and this is a very accurate 3d model that's perfectly to scale um so that's incredibly helpful just in terms of being able to draw things out and figure out where our cloud hardware is going to go and with the that particular said, sizes as well, right? So you're not like, you don't, don't yeah. get, in, in, get into trouble like with the corner panel kind of hitting the, the, the ceiling panel if you haven't yeah. kind of properly planned that in advance. Yeah. Right, so I can see like the exact height that I needed to drop this cloud down. However, I did not know how to use SketchUp uh, or any sort of like 3D modeling software when I started putting my first studios together um, or even working on studio spaces for other people. And I did all of this with a pen, like pencil and paper. Um, you know, you just sketch out the room's dimensions, draw the rectangle in, draw your treatment in so that you have a really solid plan in terms of where things are going to go before you start drilling holes and putting hardware up on the, the wall or the ceiling. Um, and the install guides that we have, particularly like the cloud install guide, really walks you through how do you find um, the actual, like the joists in your ceiling because... 
the clouds themselves are quite heavy, so you don't just want to be hanging that from drywall. That's going to get tied into the joist and, and the framing for the structure. So that requires both knowing where your cloud is going to go and then also where that framing is. Um, and so there's definitely some math there just in terms of figuring out like, you know, where does the frame, well, let me take the x-ray view off here so we can see it a little bit better. But these lines shown on the back of the cloud are the actual framing for the cloud. So then what we had to figure out was, you know, in this case, the joists are running this way. Uh, and so we just had to figure out where they intersect with our clouds. And that's what these lines are shown here. So once I knew where the joists were in the room and the distance from the front wall, I could draw those in, figure out where the cloud placement was. Uh, so just a lot of planning. I think, you know, yeah. from a like physical standpoint in terms of like the actual work in the room, the installs are pretty simple. There's not a lot of tools involved. Um, none of it's super hard or intricate. It's just the planning because you're taking, you know, panels that one, there's a lot of them. So you want them to look good together. Uh, and then you also have to figure out what's happening in your room in that physical space and then how to make everything fit within that. But the more you can do on paper, uh, the better the install will go. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And I mean, um, maybe one thing to add from my my experience usually uh the the kind of the the ceiling and ceiling corner panels are a good place to start when you're first installing panels because obviously once your kind of vertical corner panels are in or even your sidewall panels are in you've got a much reduced space to actually put up ladders and like kind of handle all the stuff that goes under the ceiling so uh, at least that's how we did it i don't know how it is for you but we always started with the ceiling so that's kind of gone all those panels aren't like in a corridor somewhere blocking you uh, from working right. on the rest of the room um so i always thought that was uh, that was kind of important yeah uh it depends a little bit like just on the room itself in the order mm. that, that i'd say we install in but like in this in this room uh we did all of these soffit corners first and then the clouds and then the walls oh sorry we did the soffit corners then these corners because again mm -hmm. <laughs> they had to go in before the clouds um and then all the wall panels. Right, right, right. I mean, it's it's a bit a bit of a puzzle that you're, you're trying to figure out kind of how things fit together, or you have to think yeah. about how things fit together, and then just kind of go through the process once in your mind, putting each individual up, seeing if there are any issues with any other panels that you might have already put in there or not, and, uh, right. and just kind of figure out a, a rough order in which to go through this, right? Yeah, and then one thing we do get, well, I'm thinking about it, we get asked a lot, you know, how do we, um, install panels with an air gap and there are mm -hmm. several ways to do it but one of the way we kind of oh, yeah. we tend to do it is to Go basically mm -hmm. make a shelf mm -hmm. um so just you know very simply using l brackets and depending on the depth of the air gap that you want the you know two by four two by six or whatever the dimensions it would be um in, in metric to you know get the air gap that you're looking for <laughs> yes yeah, stick um, to imperial it's fine yeah i'm like i don't know um <laughs> I know some of it. So like a hundred, like this is a hundred and fifty mil millimeter air gap, mm -hmm. six inches. Um, hopefully that's right. But yeah, so that using L correct. brackets, L brackets, and um, and just dimensional lumber is a very quick and easy way to create a shelf that's you know both strong enough to actually hold the base trap panels and also provide the air gap, um, and a a very clean look to it. Totally. And I mean, it looks great, right? Because it, it's it's hidden behind the panel. It's very clean, uh, and you, right. you have the flexibility to do if you do it that way to to adjust the position of the panels to some extent. Uh, so that's a that's a great um, great way to go about it. Yeah. Um, the fi final question, I guess, one final question to this all this is, looking at just how much goes into this room, how much does that actually cost when people hire you to do an install like this? to this scale, how much would that cost, roughly speaking? Yeah, so I just totaled it up a little uh, uh, earlier today. All of the acoustic treatment in here, uh, including the installation, which like, so we do installs all over the Nashville area where we're based and ship stuff all over the country. But if we were doing the install um, here in town, it would be like just over $10,000. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's definitely a lot of treatment. We don't, it's more than I would say we do in most studio setups. and. In, in that kind of space but uh it's definitely a very complete approach 
And so if, um, as a recommendation, if people are just starting out, what would you recommend as a, as a, a kind of a good starting point that actually makes a significant impact and how much would that cost? Um, I mean, you can start to make a pretty, you know, pretty significant impact. Um, depends on like if you're starting from nothing or if you already have a treated space. But I'd say first and foremost, you can make a huge impact uh, just by moving your speakers in your listening position. So right. without spending any money, you know, if they, you know, if they haven't seen it yet, but like go whack and watch the first video in this series exactly. and really show mm -hmm. how important speaker placement is, uh, how important listening position placement is. Uh, and that's true in both untreated rooms and it's still very true in treated rooms. And then from there, you can, you know, if you have a thousand dollars, you can really start to improve things if you have a room that doesn't have anything in it. Um, one of the things that will start to occur as you treat a space is like each next step tends to do a little bit less than the step before it. So it's not to say that these things aren't important if you want to make, you know, the best room possible, but this cloud here will not have a massive impact on like what is heard here. Yeah. Does it have a big impact on the room as a whole? So if there's people sitting back there listening, absolutely. Does it contribute to the low frequency absorption and the overall decay time in this room? For sure. But it's like in terms of the big steps that need to be taken, you know, I could start deleting things here and that room from a, you know, listening position standpoint would perform quite well. Yeah. It's not going to be the same, but it will be great. So you can really start to make really big improvements, you know, for, I don't know, five hundred dollars to a thousand dollars and then every kind of incrementally start to treat more and more we do a lot of rooms and stages mm -hmm. because there's not one super set formula for things it's, it's it can be a really helpful way to approach rooms because we can start to see where are we making the biggest impact and the biggest improvements uh and then you can very easily spend you know up to like ten thousand dollars or so in a room like this where it's kind of the overall complete treatment setup totally and I mean, I think that's really the great thing and the main advantage to working with panels, uh, keeping it modular like that, is that yeah. you have that that possibility of taking it in steps, right? Yeah, and obviously sure. you can't, I mean, for people who are f only thinking about this for the first time, obviously you can't g go to Music City Acoustics or Acoustics Insider and then say, I want to invest 500 euros, $500, and then fix everything in the room. That's just not how it works, right? Right. Uh, but you can get started on that path and we can kind of tell you and advise you and guide you through making that investment really count as much as possible. Um, and then you have that option of gain ex gaining experience with that, understanding how much that does and doesn't do, and then think about or understand what the next steps might be and then take those next steps further down the line if you want to, right? And I think that's really the, the the really big plus when we're working with panels like that, like this, in comparison to doing a fixed install. Yeah. Um, yeah. Also, price-wise, because obviously doing a fixed install, right? The, the the starting point is probably 10k, and that's probably even not enough. You know. So there's yeah. uh, there's there's um, there's kind of a there's a gap there in terms of what you can do with panels versus doing a full build out um, and depending on your budget this is probably a uh, is probably the best kind of value for your money uh, if you are just taking those first steps or even taking your second and third step for sure and it's all, you know, at least for us we work on a lot of um, a lot of studios even for like the bigger mixing engineers or producers that we work with they don't always stay in one spot for all that long. And so it's like, we just did a mix room and he's like, you know, I want to make sure I can take everything with me because I'll probably be here for three years or so, but it's not like the room that they're going to be in forever. And so if it's all modular, um, you can take it with you, start building out the new studio with it and build on it from there if it's a bigger space. Uh, and it just keeps it very flexible. Totally, totally. Um, I think that's, probably a good point to move on to two things uh unless you is there anything else you still want to mention about the actual placement no i think that covers it great um because I, there are basically obviously two things uh that people are probably wondering the first one is measurements 
And uh, let me just kind of uh, hint at that. That's what we're going to be focusing on in the next video. Yeah, so stay tuned for that. That's going to be on my <coughs> channel again. Uh, and then we're going to go dive deep into comparing the measurements from this room to the empty room, which we did in the first video. Um, and uh, so you're going to see everything there is to know about what that tells us. Um, but what I still want to kind of talk to you about is what does it feel like? What does it actually sound like in there? We've gone through this entire technical process of describing this, but what, how, what's the first impact? I mean, you, you only finished putting every, the, the gobos in last night, uh, but what's your yeah. first impression? Uh, I've listened to about three minutes worth of music in here, maybe. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but it sounded great. It was, um, yeah, it, it really sounded fantastic. And what I think, you know, for us, rarely do we actually treat a room this like fully and completely because mm -hmm. most people are like, why would I put a base trap cloud in the back half of my room? Um, so one of the most striking things was just walking around and hearing how consistent the low end response was. Um, certainly changes a little bit from you know area to area as it, as it always will but it was uh that was pretty striking and remarkable but just the experience up front here at the listening position uh so far was was pretty striking and fantastic um there's definitely some things i think i would like to kind of further improve and tweak and change and mm -hmm. experiment with and uh that's definitely the fun part of having a a, a demo room now is a space that we can kind of continuously change and try things out and then see what works and what doesn't work and how can we potentially improve things further and potentially develop new ideas or products uh, for things that can really take things to the next level. But uh, as a whole, it sounds really awesome. Uh, Sweet. So I'm pretty pumped. And yeah, there's a few things I think I that will probably change just in terms of like the scatter faces, knowing mm -hmm. we may want more of those, the gobos. But um and then potentially tune membrane traps uh, a little bit more low end control and like you know really low down 35 hertz or so uh, if we can get that working but it it feels great and then it it's always one of those this is always kind of the scary part when you start looking at all the panels that you're going to put in a room uh, and you look at the empty room and then you look at everything like stacked up outside and you're like how in the world are we going to fit all that in fits, there yeah, yeah. Um, and knowing that we're going to space like all the sidewall panels you know, six inches off the wall. I was a little worried about how it was going to feel walking in here, um, but it feels great. It doesn't feel, I mean, you know, there's not a lot of furniture in any, or anything in here, but it doesn't feel like the walls are closing in on you. Um, and so at, oh, the overall feel of the space is, 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 is really pretty awesome. And it's it's dead quiet as well. I mean, as you can probably hear. Yeah. But uh, when we just jumped on this call at the very beginning, I thought the audio wasn't working, and then Graham at some point <laughs> said hello, and I was just like ah, <laughs> and came out of nowhere. Yeah, it is it is very quiet in here now, which is nice because there's a wood chop right on the other side of that oh, really? wall. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay, well, we make everything right right over there, and so it's uh you can still hear it, but it doesn't come through nearly with the same so impact that actually, now. So there is some some improvement to isolation from the the panels on the wall actually. Uh yeah, I think from like a purely technical standpoint, the the same amount of sound is coming through the wall. The impact that it has on the room uh isn't as noticeable in here. And that is true that it, that that impacts and correlates to STC ratings and a whole bunch of more technical stuff that we don't necessarily need to get into. But yeah, it's uh, as you start to start to treat any space, whether it's you know like a mixed room, and you're worried about outdoor traffic noise or an office space, the more treatment you have in here, the less noticeable and impactful those ex you know uh, extraneous sounds will be. Yeah, it's funny how that happens. Even though on a technical side, it's probably not improving all that much. But just because right. your perception of that noise changes uh, quite a bit um, through being in such a controlled space, it f doesn't feel as impactful anymore. Yeah. And obviously, we bonus. should say also bonus. that... Bonus points. Yeah, bonus points. I was going to say, bo bonus tip for this video. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, obviously, uh, caveat is uh, you're still not going to have any low frequency isolation with panels like this no. on the wall. Yeah, like uh, this is we're talking kind of high mid and high frequency stuff that that changes in, in a perceived way. But uh, you are not going to be able to improve if your neighbor is kind of cranking up uh, their stereo system. It's not it's, <laughs> no. it's not going to get it significantly better. 
Um, but maybe to just round it off here or um, leave it at that for this video, I guess. Um, yeah. Thanks, first of all. I mean, again, for that detailed walkthrough and um, for everybody watching, we're going to look at the, the measurements of this room in the next video. So be on, uh, on the lookout for that. We're going we're gonna to actually look at measurements in steps because Graham made the effort of actually doing measurements as he was putting the panels in the room, which is something you don't get to see very often because it is so much work to do. Um, so it's going to be really, really interesting. And, uh, and then obviously once we've looked at all the measurements or we're in the process of looking at that, we're also going to decide, identify any potential changes, any potential improvements we want to make. So that's going to be the video after that. Um, but uh, for now, should we leave it at that? Yeah, I think that's, I think that's great. This, uh, again, amazing work. Graham, thanks for taking thank us you. on this journey. And uh, for everybody watching, thank you for watching. I really hope you're getting something out of this. And see you in the next video. Yeah, see ya.